Friends, welcome to another midweek Lenten reflection with us at Bethlehem. It is a joy to be with you during this time. This is a time for us to stop in the middle of the week and dwell in God's word as we make our 40-day Lenten journey toward the cross. We've now been doing this for a few weeks, so what I'm about to say isn't going to sound new at all, but my encouragement to you in this time would be to find some way for you to set apart this time as holy and sacred for you and your relationship with Jesus. Something I like to do to set the scene for myself is to do something like light a candle. So if you have a a candle in your house or wherever you're watching this video, I would encourage you, push pause on this video, grab a candle and light it as a reminder to you that Jesus is the light of the world and that this is a special moment for you in the middle of the week. If you don't have a candle, don't worry, but if there's some way for you to set apart this time as sacred for you and to crowd out all of the other distractions, take a moment to do that. As we begin, We begin with God's name, the name he placed on us in baptism and the name that he continues to speak over us. And when we call upon this name, we trust that he is indeed present with us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you would come and dwell with us by your spirit in this moment. Lord, the week can easily become full and fast. We ask that in this time you would quiet our soul, that you would put away all of the noise and the distraction that surrounds us so often. Fix our hearts and our minds on you. Open our ears and our hearts that we might hear your word. Let it take root in us that it might grow and produce all kinds of fruit. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We now join together to speak words of Psalm 19. I invite you, if you have the text of the scriptures accessible, to pull it out, either in a hard copy or on your phone, and say these words along with me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Friends, we now enter a moment of confession, acknowledging to God in all honesty that we are imperfect, broken, sinful people in need of his help and forgiveness. I love moments like these, moments of sincerity where we can be real, where we can be raw. And when we are, we can trust that the Lord doesn't shun us, he doesn't push us away, He invites us to to draw closer so that he might embrace us with his word of forgiveness for us today. So with that in mind, I invite you to join me now as we confess to God our Father. Let us make ready our hearts to confess the imperfection of our love today. Lord, though it is our desire to serve you well this day, We confess that we have again fallen short of your righteousness in our thoughts, our intentions, our actions, and our words. We have responded and reacted without grace. 
We have chosen to think and act in ways that are unprofitable for us and those around us. Forgive us for the things we know and the things we don't. Forgive us for the harm we have done and for the good we have failed to do. Forgive also the condition of our hearts. We are turned in on ourselves and this makes us forever in need of a savior. Be merciful to us. Friends, God's word tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, upon your confession, it is my joy to announce the grace of God to all of you. God in his mercy has given his son Jesus to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins the ones you know, the ones you don't. He has given his son Jesus to repair the fallen condition of your heart and make you new. By his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave, the promise of eternal life and righteousness before God is true for you. So I announce to you, friend, that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now turn again to God's word. The scripture for our meditation today comes from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were afraid And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said, Teacher, We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, do you not, do you not know what you are asking? You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is God's word for us. Friends, I'm struck by this passage. I'm struck by the humanity of Jesus' disciples and find it really quite easy to put myself in their shoes. They're making their way toward Jerusalem. They are, like we, making a journey toward the cross. 
toward Good Friday. As they go, Jesus is working to focus their hearts on what's about to happen and reiterates to them that the Son of Man is going to be handed over into the hands of the scribes and they're going to mock him, spit on him, kill him. And the third day they are, that he is going to rise again. Jesus is giving them the script for the story that is unfolding in front of their eyes. Despite his attempt at focusing their hearts, there are two of them that don't seem to get the picture at all. It's the sons of Zebedee, James and John, two of the three who are some of the closest to Jesus in that kind of inner ring of Jesus' disciples. And they come to Jesus and they ask him for a favor. And the favor is, Lord, can you elevate us to positions of high status in your glory? When you rule in your kingdom, can you give the two of us the opportunity to sit at your right and your left, basically making us your number twos? And Jesus says to them, well, that's not mine to grant, James and John. That is prepared for those whom it is prepared. It isn't for me simply to to give that kind of position or status to you. Well, what happens? The 10 other disciples hear about this conversation between James, John, and Jesus And as Mark tells us, they were indignant. If it were I, I would probably have felt the same sorts of things. Who do these guys think they are trying to to get the cushy spot right next to Jesus in his glorious kingdom? An argument arises between the 12. We don't know exactly what was going on, but I imagine that they're arguing about Who's the greatest? They're comparing themselves to one another. They're they're taking stock of all of the giftedness and abilities that they have and, and stacking them up against one another. They're racking their brains trying to remember the various conversations they've had with Jesus, the specific things that only they might know, or maybe some of the, the specific missions Jesus has sent them on. Maybe some have performed a few more healings. Maybe, maybe some others have cast out a few more demons and they're jostling with one another to see who's the greatest. I think we can very easily place ourselves in the disciples' shoes. It's really not all that difficult for us to play the comparison game. We're very good at comparatives if we're being honest with ourselves. We might compare ourselves to coworkers. Maybe we compare ourselves to neighbors. Maybe we're we're still making lots of comparatives between us and our siblings. The list could go on and on. There are people that you are prone to compare yourself to. And you, if you are honest about it, in your heart, have a concern for greatness. All of us, at one level or another, desire to be promoted, to have a a spot of, of status and recognition. Well, Jesus says that among his followers, comparatives are not the way to go at all. For a follower of Jesus, making comparisons is simply not to be. Jesus says, don't you know the the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over one another. They are concerned about who is the greatest and they work at it. They do whatever it takes to prop themselves up, to promote themselves to positions of authority and status. That is what the world does. Jesus says, not so among you, dear friends, my beloved followers, not so. Anyone who desires to be great among you must become the servant. 
Whoever wants to be first ought to become last. See, with Jesus, it is not about self-promotion. It is not about comparatives. You know why? Because if you are a follower of Jesus, you have absolutely no need for comparatives. You don't need to compare yourself to anyone else because you have the superlative, the ultimate in Jesus. And realize what you have in Jesus. Not only do you have the superlative, but you have the superlative, the ultimate, who became the lowest, the last, the least. Jesus says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Friend, Jesus made himself the lowest, the last, and the least for you. And because of his move of self-demotion, you have been promoted into the kingdom of God. You now enter the presence of God and you stand in a position you couldn't possibly earn for yourself. And there is nothing more that you need. And because there is nothing more you need, you certainly do not need to make comparisons with anyone else around you. You do not need that to tell you who you are, to tell you that you have worth. Jesus has already spoken that to you. He has spoken to you who you are and how much worth you have because he came to serve you on the cross. So friends, as you keep making your journey toward Jerusalem, toward the cross, rest. Rest and be content in the promises of Jesus. You have the superlative, the ultimate in Jesus. And he has come to give his life for yours. Amen. Friends, we now enter a time of prayer. As we pray, I will offer a a handful of petitions, and we will also create some space for you to offer up the prayers on your hearts and minds today. And then we will join together in conclusion with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Gracious Lord God, As we continue toward Jerusalem, toward the cross of Good Friday and the empty tomb of Easter Sunday, we ask that you would guide us and direct us. Orient our hearts toward you and give them rest and contentment in the promises you so freely offer us in your son, Jesus. Lord, we remember today all of those who are sick or injured, especially those on our hearts and our minds today. Would you stretch out your healing hand over them and strengthen them according to your will? Lord, for all those who mourn the death of loved ones, we ask that you would tend to them with your loving care and that you would fill them with hope that only you can supply. For you alone, Lord, have conquered death and the grave by your son, Jesus. Father, we lift up to you your church and ask that you would continue to strengthen and preserve her and give her a greater boldness to go out into the world with your word and your truth and your promises proclaiming them boldly that even more might come to know you as Lord and Savior. Now, Lord, we come to you with any of the petitions, requests, 
intercessions on our hearts and minds today. Father, hear us in the name of Jesus who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, as we go, we go with the blessing of the Lord. The God who comes to you now sends you. Sends you to the places you live, you work, you play. And as he sends you, he sends you with a word of good. He speaks over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.